Hello, Redemption Church family. Hello, hello. We are back together again and so excited to be able to gather in person, person to worship our great God and King, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. I know many of you are still joining us online, and we are grateful that we get to be together in spirit today. Let me give you guys a little bit of a road map for our time together. Uh, we're going to try and have a little bit of shorter services, but there's a lot to be said given the state of our world right now, given the state of the church, and not to mention we just want to be around each other. So uh, it's going to be hard not to, to have a long, drawn-out, uh, prolonged service together. But during our time together today, we're going to get to worship in song, we're going to get to worship in prayer, we're going to get to worship in the preaching and teaching of God's word, and we're going to worship in communion. We'd also like to, to worship the Lord in the giving of our tithes and offerings uh, for those here in person uh, as well as online. And on that note, we wanted to say thank you so much for how you have continued to give joyfully and sacrificially to the work of the ministry here at Redemption. And we're so excited to be wrapping up uh, this series in the book of Ruth. Thank you, Nate, for uh, all the time and energy uh, in study and in preaching, walking us through this series. You have uh, really blessed us, and uh, we're excited to, to see that story and that narrative come to a close today. We're also really excited about uh, our next book. We're going to be jumping into the book of Philippians next. And I think that uh, time is really going to provide us a lot of wisdom, a lot of truth, and a lot of guidance in light of everything that's going on in our world today. And I know that there are uh, many in our church that are facing uh, hardships and trials and pain and change. And that's just uh, in our own lives, in our own day-to-day -day lives. And then you start to throw in all this um, stuff that's going on in the world around us. We've, we've had our lives upended by this viral pandemic. And then less than a week ago, uh, we watched on video uh, in Minneapolis, George Floyd's life being taken away from him. And it just adds more grief and more anger and more pain. And we mourn this loss of life. It was senseless. And, and we want to pray for justice. And, and we confess that something needs to change. We believe in, in the sacred value of his life and all human life from conception to the grave. And we believe it's uh, not something that we can ignore. We can't ignore injustice and we can't ignore uh, inequalities. But what are we supposed to do uh, as the church? What are we supposed to do with such polarizing and potentially dividing events? Uh, what should we do as the church when we see things differently? Uh, how should we proceed in this time with this pandemic? Should we open the church up for in-person services yet? Should we wait? Should we all be wearing masks or should we not? What's the solution for racism in America? What's the church's role there? You guys, we have a, an enemy that wants to see us divided, that wants to see us scattered, and wants to see us defeated. But that's not what we want to be at redemption. That's not what God wants for his bride. And it's easy to be unite, united and, and unified when things are easy and when we agree on something. It's really easy to be unified at that time. But when it's hard and when it's uncomfortable and when we see two different courses of action, to be united then, that's when we see Jesus really demonstrating his power in us. And I want to be that together as a church right now. It's not going to be easy. It's going to cost us something, and it's going to stretch us, but God is going to be glorified because of it. And I'm grateful for that, that he has given us an opportunity to, to see the rubber meet the road, to say, if this is what you believe, if this is who you are, if this is what you proclaim, that you've been transformed by Jesus, then let's live it out together. Amen? This weekend marks seven weeks, about 49 days past Easter. And this weekend we remember Pentecost. And as I was thinking about Pentecost and, and the same spirit that went before the Israelites in the desert that uh, was uh, there in the cloud and there in the pillar of fire and there that filled the tabernacle now fills us, though we're sin-stained. We have that same spirit inside of us. And, and as a church, we want to walk by the spirit keeping the gospel as the forefront, and then filtering everything else through its life-transforming power. So let's pray to that end, and then we'll get to spend some time in worship together. Father God, we are so grateful and so excited to be able to be back in person, to be able to gather together, to be able to fellowship, uh, to be able to see one another in person. And God, we know that you are enthroned above all things, that you are not surprised, you are not caught off guard, God, you are not taken aback by anything because uh, you know it all. 
And God, you know our thoughts before they're on our tongue. You know every hair on our head. And God, you can be trusted even in the hardship, even in the pain, uh, even in the, the suffering, God. And there is reason to rejoice. We are ones with hope. We have the hope of eternity. And God, you are uh, a God who is with us. Thank you for uh, our children's church and how they have uh, so shepherded and, and, and led our children through this time, through so many videos. And, and I'm just, uh, God, so grateful that you are Emmanuel, that you are God with us, that we have seen that and that we know that to be true. Thank you that this, um, this day to remember Pentecost is, is uh, redemptive, that it's a historical confirmation that Christ is risen and reigning. And God, we want to walk uh, by your spirit. Thank you for uh, indwelling us, for giving us your spirit. And we do pray for uh, unity. We pray for uh, protection for our church family. Would you protect us uh, physically uh, from sickness, God? Would you protect us spiritually and keep us, um, God, uh, following hard after you together? So as we lift our voices today, as we uh, come under the preaching and teaching of your word, God, would you have our hearts and would you be glorified here in our midst? Would we leave here uh, more in love with Jesus uh, because of this time and because of your active work in each of our lives? We love you, God, and we pray all these things in Christ's name. And God's people said, amen. Hello, church family. It's great to see all of your faces in person, finally. Would you guys stand with us uh, as we worship together? Before the world, before the world was made, before you spoke it to me, you were the king of kings. Yeah, you were, yeah, you were, and now you're reigning still, enthroned above all things. Angels and saints cry out, we join them.
rest alone. My hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of No guilt. We are back together again. It is such an honor and privilege to get to gather in this place once again. And so I, I kind of struggled a little bit, if I'll be totally honest, um, with the idea of coming back for the first time, closing 
down the book of Ruth, and Jeff was actually super helpful this week saying, man, the book of Ruth has really been about broken things made beautiful, and how beautiful as the story of Ruth comes to a close that we get to once again be together. And so I'd ask you to just uh, bow your heads and pray with me, and then we're going to jump into Ruth chapter 4. So God, we, Lord, as, as we gather yet again uh, in this place to make much of the name of Jesus, I pray that worship would continue, Lord, as we come under your word. Lord, that we, um, Lord, that this season, as we just sang about, Lord, would, would cause us to say, Lord, when you return, like, God, this, this world is not our home. Lord, let this season be a reminder of that. Lord, let, it, let our hope be in the life to come. And so, Father, we want to worship you. We want to celebrate you um, as we spend time in this story, your story. God, may we marvel at your son. It is in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Ruth chapter 4. We have been uh, making our way through this snapshot, this love story of Ruth. And if you've been streaming online, you know that we've seen um, a lot of brokenness. We've seen a lot of pain and hardship as we've uh, experienced throughout this narrative and story um, political um, hardship. We've seen economic hardship hardship and brokenness. We have seen uh, family crisis as there's been loss and death. We've seen hardship in that a family has had to relocate and move from one place to another. We've seen pain and really like dangerous working conditions in Ruth as she goes out and gleans and gathers in the fields. We've seen a lot of brokenness. And in the past few weeks, as we've been in this story, we've seen the shift as the brokenness and God's subtle hand has never left, Ruth or Naomi is now acting beautifully. And this broken story is being made more and more beautiful. As last week we were at the beginning of Ruth chapter 4, and we saw this legal scene where Boaz entered into the courts. He sat down at the gates. He waited. He met with this other redeemer. He overcame the obstacle to be able to claim his prize. He wanted to marry Ruth, who our story is named after, he wanted her as his prize. He wanted to be able to redeem her. And he overcame the obstacle of this other redeemer, this guy that stood in between him and what he wanted. And he's now able to walk the road of redeeming Ruth and Naomi, who've experienced so much pain and so much brokenness. And last week, if you streamed with us, we talked about how wise and faithful We've seen Boaz be throughout this story. And then we saw really the people in Bethlehem celebrate with Boaz that, man, you get to take this lady as your wife, and we just want blessing and great things for you. And we're, we're so excited for the road God has for you and how important it is to be surrounded by the right type of people who want to spur us on in holiness and in truth. And so today we pick up our story looking yet again at the beauty as we wrap up Ruth. This morning we're going to look at the beauty of in faithful legacy. And so if you have your note sheets, hopefully they're scattered around or on your tables. How exciting is it to have note sheets again? For me, I'm a fill in the blank guy. Like this has been, that's been probably one of the hardest parts for me is what do we take notes on? This is so exciting. Um, We're going to jump right in. Ruth chapter 4, verse 13. As we look at the faithful legacy of Ruth and Boaz, uh, let's just dive right in. It says, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. He went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Let's just stop right there. If you've got your note sheets, that first fill in the blank. What I want us to see as we talk about the beauty and faithful legacy is we have to acknowledge and pass on that we have a big God. If you've been tracking with us in our story of Ruth, you know that Ruth's story, part of the brokenness and pain in her story is that she was married to Malon, one of Naomi's sons, for over 10 years, and that God had closed her womb. She'd experienced no children. And culturally, this would have been really hard for her. And so last week we saw Boaz won the right to marry Ruth, and our story picks up here with kind of a a, a summary of at least nine months' worth of time where Boaz took Ruth. And I love that word, took. 
The first time we see that word used in the Bible is way back in Genesis 2 when God created Adam. It says that he took Adam and placed him in the garden. Just the power, the presence of our God taking Adam. Now we see here Boaz, our kinsman redeemer of Ruth, takes Ruth. Boaz throughout our story has been very patient. He's been very noble. He's a man of integrity. He's wise. We looked at his leadership and how people have responded to him last week. We saw when uh, Ruth presented and made herself available in Ruth chapter 3, he was like, I'm, I'm blown away by you, but we're going to do this the right way. He's been so patient and wise, and now he's won his bride, and the time has come, and now we see a passionate, eager Boaz who says she became his wife. He went in. He's going to enjoy all the blessings of marriage, and then we see the bigness of our God. He gave her conception. He opened her womb. And not just, imagine her brokenness, her pain. She has been barren. She's been ashamed. She's felt like there's something missing and her, she's lost her husband. There's been so much hurt around this area for Ruth. And now she's been redeemed. She has a new heart. She has a new family. She has a new husband. And she goes and now she has the ability. Life is growing inside of her. This is the bigness of God on display, and it doesn't stop. I love that our author doesn't just stop with she get, she's pregnant, but culturally there's so much here. She bore a son. This is the fulfillment. This is the blessing and the beauty of what, um, of what Boaz said he was going to do in Ruth uh, the, in last week, the beginning of Ruth chapter 4, where he wanted to redeem the line of Elimelech. He was willing, he wanted offspring to restore that line. And we see here now that there's a son. That the line of Elimelech, that Boaz, that God has blessed them with a son to carry on the family name. This was huge in this time, in this culture. This is God's provision, God's hand, God's blessing, and God's beauty on display. And I feel like we need to understand when we talk about leaving a faithful legacy, having a faithful legacy, how are we believing in our great, big, powerful God? It would have been so easy for Ruth to think it's so awesome that I've been redeemed, but man, I experienced so many years of hardship around this issue. I just don't know if it can happen for me. And we see God is bigger. He's opened her womb and she bore a son. And the story doesn't end there. In verse 14, it says, Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord. Let's just pause real quick right there. We'll read the rest of the verse. The last time we saw these women was in Ruth chapter 2. Naomi and Ruth had traveled from Moab back to Bethlehem. And when Naomi left, she left with sons and a husband to really abandon God's people and God's economy in search of a better life somewhere else. And she comes back with no husband, with no sons, with no grandchildren, and just this one straggler Moabite who would have not been accepted daughter-in-law. And these women in Bethlehem just kind of began to talk about Naomi, they're, they were talking, they're like, is that Naomi? Like, she left, she abandoned us, she, and now she's back. That's the last time we saw them. Now these women are back. And Naomi has been redeemed. Ruth has been redeemed. Naomi now has a grandchild. And the women respond by saying, blessed be our great big God, Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel. Blessed be God, who has not left you this day without a redeemer. And may his name be renowned. In Israel. These women who, who have seen God's hand in Naomi's life can't help but point at how big God is, that he never left Naomi. The last interaction we have with Naomi and these women, Naomi was freaking out like in the middle of downtown Bethlehem saying, don't call me Naomi anymore, call me Mara, I'm bitter. The Lord has dealt harshly and bitterly with me. His hand has been against me. And now these women are pointing out to Naomi, look at how big God is. He's blessed you, he's never left you, he's always been there. And now you have, you're holding in your hand, this little baby boy who's going to carry on your family line. May he, I think, he's talk, I think they're talking about her grandson here, may he be famous, renowned in Israel. They want him 
they want Naomi to see how big God is. They continue on and say, he shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. That literally is, may he sustain your gray hair, which I just thought was kind of funny. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who's more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. They acknowledge that this, this boy, this baby boy, again, the last time we saw this interaction, Naomi was not in a good place. And now they're saying, Naomi, you are pleasant. God is a big God, and he's brought you this grandson. He's given you this faithful legacy and he's going to restore your life. He's going to sustain your gray hair. He's going to keep you living longer because now you've got somebody to celebrate and take care of and help with. And we're going to see that here in a second. And then they, hit, and then they say this, this next thing that is so profound and so countercultural. And if, again, if you were with us and you streamed when we talked about Naomi coming back into town and how she stood there and said, I've got nothing. I've returned empty. And the truth of the matter was she didn't return empty. She had Ruth standing right next to her. She had Ruth when she came back into town. She had somebody who'd pledged and committed to be faithful and right by her side through thick and thin. And now these, these women in Bethlehem say to her, may this, this daughter-in-law who loves you, who's more to you than seven sons, that is a huge statement for these women who have, would have been raised to not believe that a Moabite was worth anything. They would not have accepted her e eagerly or readily. And yet they say, she's better than seven sons. Biblically, seven is, is the number of fulfillment or completion or perfection. And so there's this, this understanding that this Moabite woman... Her character has been put on display. Her faithfulness, her love, her hard work, and her good ethics have been made known throughout all of Bethlehem. And these women say, she's better than the best family you could ever imagine. These women think so highly of Ruth. And Ruth has given birth to this son. They can't help. There's such a beautiful picture here of God's bigness, God's presence, God's beauty in the midst and through the pain and the brokenness. And then we continue on, not just to see that a faithful legacy needs to have a big view of God, but also to understand that our God, who is a big God, sees the big picture. That's your second fill in the blank. In verse 16 and 17, it says, Naomi took the child, laid him on her lap, and became his nurse. I don't think this is a medical nurse. I don't think this is, um, this is, I think this is essentially saying she was an awesome grandma. She loved this little baby boy. She was so excited. And again, if you were with us in the broken part of this story, if you were, pay, if, if you were in Ruth chapter one, when Naomi found herself in a foreign country with no husband, with no sons, with very little money, very little option, very little opportunity. I don't think in a million years she believed that one day she would get to hold her grandson. That was gone in her mind. When they're journeying back to Bethlehem after they've heard that the Lord has restored the famine and the hardship in Bethlehem and there's hope there, she's returning, but she turns to, Na or to Ruth and, and Orpah, her two daughters-in-law, and she says, there's th I can't do anything for you. My family line has very little light at the end of the tunnel. And yet we see God's big picture when, when Naomi is freaking out in town square and says, there is, God has been bitter, he's been harsh, his hand has been against me. And she says very raw, very real things about God in a dark, broken moment. Our God sees the big picture. And I just had this beautiful picture in my mind this week of God sitting back there as Naomi's freaking out in Ruth chapter 2 going, you don't know what I have st in store for you. You're going to sit in a rocking chair and snuggle with your grandson. And this is hard and it's broken, but I'm here. And it's going to be so beautiful. 
when you get to be there and you get to help Ruth, your daughter-in-law, and Boaz, your kinsman redeemer, who's going to restore your family line, and you get to be just the best of grandmas. And that's the picture we see here in, in verse 16. As we see God sees the big picture, we go on then in verse 17, and that we're going to get the telescope pulled back a little further here. The women of the neighborhood, they come back. They give him a name, this grandson. We're going to get an identity and a name for him, saying, a son has been born to Naomi. I love that the women here, again, they're encouraging the family line. They're encouraging Naomi as the, the matriarch here of this story. They named him Obed. That, that word, that name literally means servant. It's kind of shorthand for Obadiah, servant of Yahweh. Um, and then we finally get, we've been in this book, this is the seventh week we've been studying Ruth's story. And we've looked at Naomi. We've looked at Elimelech and Malon and Kilion and Orpah and Ruth and Boaz and this other redeemer that didn't even get a name and these women in downtown Bethlehem. And there's, there's been all of these characters. And now we get to why we have this book. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. King David. Again, we've, we've looked at how this book takes place in an interesting time in Israel's history where uh, they don't have a, a strong leader like Moses or Joshua anymore, and they're not yet under um, a, a king who's ruling and leading them. And so they find themselves in this time of the judges where more often than not, the judges were wicked and everybody's just kind of doing whatever they feel like. And it's a very wicked, very hard time. And this is a snapshot of a family during this season, but it's so much more than just a snapshot. It's so much more than just a love story. This is the legacy of King David, one of the mighty warrior kings in Israel's history. And so our original audience would have been sitting there listening to somebody read this story, and they would have heard, wait a second, we've been learning about David's great-grandmother? Are you kidding me? Out of all of this brokenness, out of all of this pain, out of all of this up and down, we get our King David? This is huge. This is why we have this story. is because Ruth leaves not just a faithful legacy behind, but one of the, the greatest stories, one of the greatest kings in Israel's history comes from her faithful legacy. And we see how God has seen the big picture. That he knew all along that from Ruth was going to come, as just a few pages from here in 1 Samuel is spoken over David, that he's going to be a man after God's own heart. And yes, David is going to have brokenness and pain, and David has to leave a legacy that we'll look to and talk about in just a moment. But we see here this big picture of what this story has been all about, a faithful legacy that gets us to King David. And then we come to verse 18 through 22. And we see that not just does our big God see the big picture, but we see the big plan, third fill in the blank there, of our great God. Verse 18, now these are the generations of Perez. If you were paying attention last week, we talked about how Perez is a, a, a character or a man from all the way back in the book of Genesis. And if, if you went back and read Genesis 38, you saw the brokenness of his legacy, his story, and how God has used and redeemed and made beautiful even his broken story. That character comes back now, and we see these are the generations all the way back to Genesis. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. And we see the great big plan of our God. That going all the way back to Genesis, God knew what he was doing. One of the themes throughout our story, our study of the story of Ruth, has been that God's subtly working and moving his story forward. And we see God's big plan. And you know, when I was in seminary, one of the things they taught us when you came to genealogies like that was read it just like I just did. Read it fast, read it confident, and move on. 
Just don't leave people room to question, did you say that the right way? Why'd you say salmon? I thought it was salmon. Um, But I sat with the genealogy a little bit this week, and here's what really began to stir in my mind and heart. Our great big God sees the great bigger picture and has a big plan. And in his big picture and in his big plan, yes, we have Davids and Moseses and Joshuas and Peter and Paul in the New Testament and all of these pillars of faith. But you know, in God's story, we also have Aminadabs and Nashons and Salmons. Guys, we maybe don't know a ton about, but they're a part of God's plan. They're a part of God's story. And our author saw fit here to include them in this faithful legacy, getting to King David. And what really struck me this week was that we have the opportunity to play a big part in God's big plan by allowing him to make our brokenness beautiful. By opening our minds and hearts and saying, Jesus, you are what this has been building towards. This, you want to enter in and redeem my story, just like Boaz entered in and redeemed Ruth. That's what Jesus came to do for you and I. Because the legacy doesn't end with David. If we fast forward to Matthew chapter 1, we see these people. We see Ruth and Boaz and David in Jesus' genealogy. In Jesus' legacy. And then Jesus comes and lives the life we couldn't live. He dies the death we should have died. And he now empowers us to leave behind a faithful legacy. Because the truth of the matter is, this story, Ruth's story, it's not about Ruth or Naomi or Boaz. It's not even about getting to David. It's about Jesus. Jesus is the hokey pokey. He's what it's all about. And this is building towards getting to Jesus. And then Jesus comes and now he wants to use our story. He wants your brokenness to be made beautiful. He wants to empower us to be his bride, to leave behind a faithful legacy. And so my question for you tonight is, man, do you believe in a big God? Or are you overwhelmed by your big circumstances and brokenness? Do you trust that God has a big picture? And while it may be hard right now, God's going to work and move and act in your story in beautiful ways. And it might be unbelievably hard, but God has a beautiful plan. And he wants to use you. He wants to use those pain points. He wants to bring purpose to those pain points. To magnify and glorify the name of Jesus. And so here's here's how we're going to close down the book of Ruth today. We're going to hear another story of redemption. Again, if you've been streaming with us the past several weeks, we've had lots of people being vulnerable and opening up and sharing how life has been hard and painful. And yet by the power of Jesus, by by, by the presence of his spirit and the good, ne- good news of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, he has redeemed those stories. We're going to hear another story of how broken things are made beautiful by the majestic name of Jesus. And so if you would, uh, direct your eyes to our screens as we, f- see an- as we end with one more story of beautiful redemption. <laughs> Well, we're Tim and Sharon Wilms, and we come as a package deal today. And probably the best place to start is when we became Christians. Um, Coincidentally, that happened to both of us at a pretty young age. I think we understood the gospel pretty well, but um, looking back now, I don't know that I understood the gospel going forward through my life. I was 19 years old when Tim and I started dating and I found myself praying and asking God to give me a story 
I actually use the words in that prayer, God, would you shake things up? <laughs> he started to shake things up in 1986, and I think he has been doing it for 35 years straight now. <laughs> um, within about two weeks after I prayed that prayer, Tim and I and a couple of other friends of ours were hit head on by a drunk driver. The driver of the other vehicle was killed and our two, two of our friends in the car with us were killed that night. I was in the hospital for about three weeks and then went home and recovered in a hospital bed at home for about three months. After that happened, we moved forward in life having really not dealt with it or known how to deal with it didn't really process that car accident that we had been through, almost just swept it under the rug and uh, threw ourselves into adult life. Started like most young couples talking about a family, do we want a large family, small family? Uh, we both agreed that we would like a large family and so three years into our marriage we uh, welcomed Catherine, our first child. We kept working on a large family, and 21 months later, we welcomed our second child, Joseph, into our home. Started to get into a routine in life with him at home, and we had received the news from the doctors at the time of his delivery that I should not have any more children. It wasn't hard for us. Even though we wanted a large family, we felt such a peace about what we had been blessed with. We had a daughter and we had a son and they were healthy and well and we were so incredibly grateful. Once again, I found myself praying one night. I felt God prompting me to give Joey back to him, to just say those words, he's yours, God and my answer to that prompting was no. And I was up most of that night and I cried and I argued with God and by morning I finally said the words that I knew all along that I needed to say and, and truly wanted to say, okay God, he's yours, he belongs to you. It was around Joey's um, one month birthday that um, this mama uh, sense something was wrong with him. He wasn't being himself and acting the way he should. Did some tests and realized he was pretty sick and um, made arrangements to put him on a helicopter to send him to the University of Chicago Hospital. The doctors were telling us that he would not live and the last day that we were in the hospital they took him off the vent ventilator and they put us in a room just in a dark room by ourselves and we got to hold him and we had 15 hours with him of singing and praying over him we also knew that it was a battle that he was not going to win. We recognized that we needed to give him permission to go. And so we sang Jesus Loves Me together with him. And we prayed one last time over him. And we told our son that when he saw Jesus, he should run to him. And he did. So we drove home in silence that night and that silence really continued for about a year. Um, I felt uh, the need to get the train back on the tracks because I thought that was my role to do that. About a year after he died we prayed together for the first time in a year and we just asked God to, to change something because we knew we couldn't live the rest of our lives in the same place that we had the last year. And God answered that prayer in the form of a job change. So we moved from Chicago to small town Iowa. We found a good measure of healing, a church that embraced us, a church that loved us. We 
didn't have the label of being the young couple who had just lost their baby. Having been told that we really should not have more children after Joey was born, while it was acceptable at the time, suddenly was not okay with us. Started praying and asking God, could, could we risk this? Should we risk this? We want to, we, will, we would love to have a sibling for Kat. As we were praying, we went and we looked at the hospital in the little bitty town that we had moved to, and it turned out that it was a little bitty hospital, and it had seven beds in it. <laughs> and we knew that based on my history of preterm labor because of the accident injuries, that this hospital could not care for me through pregnancy. And so it really was out of the question to get pregnant again. And we were trying to come to terms with that and continuing to pray at the same time that God would provide a way. And as we were praying, we learned that a new doctor had moved into town. He was a high-risk specialist, and his wife was a pediatrician. And we didn't even need more information than that. We just knew that God brought this man to town for us. It was a pretty rough delivery in that small town hospital. Um, I remember during the delivery, the doctors actually stepping back. There was an emergency C-section that Sharon was undergoing and they, they opened her up and they, they just stepped back in, in shock. They had never dealt with it. And this, this specialist said, get back in here. He came into my room the week after and into the um, recovery room and he said to me, and by the way, he was an atheist, and he said to me, there is no human explanation, there is no earthly explanation for why mother and baby both survived that delivery. And we had the opportunity to share with this doctor our God and his power. The concept of hesed, where God's faithfulness and, and goodness and kindness is displayed. And we had that same thing happen recently Three months ago, we were at MCR with our, our daughter and son-in-law, and it was before COVID, and we were able to be there because she was in labor with our first grandchild. Um, our son-in-law, Kurt, wheeled in our daughter, Kat, and she was holding our grandson, Joseph. And um, we didn't hear his name. We actually saw his name. Uh, our daughter had made a name tag and put it on him and it said, hello, my name is Joseph. And we just think of that story now and we think it was Hesed, God's goodness and kindness and faithfulness to the two of us. Your goodness is running after, it's running after. unbelievably hard. Wilms, I can't, I can't thank you enough for sharing. Um, man, God is so awesome. Um, and I can't think of a better way to, to celebrate that, the goodness of our God, the faithfulness of the legacy that is left behind. Um, I can't think of a better way than for the first time in a long time to get to celebrate communion. I'm gonna get super choked up here. Whew, I'll be okay, give me a second. Are we done recording? That'd be really helpful if we were done recording. Um, so hopefully on the way in here, uh, you got these little communion cups. Again, there's gonna be a lot of things that are gonna feel different, um, and, and yet our God is an unchanging, so gracious God. Um, and so here's what I wanna do, if I can make it through without crying. Oh. Um, I'm going to read 1 Corinthians when Paul gives us the instructions. And I'd like to do this 
together. I know our typical rhythm has been we come up and kind of as the Lord leads. And so if you don't have one of these, um, Jake is, is gloving up right now, and he will give them to you just to try to be as safe as possible. Um, but I'm going to read, and then I'm just going to kind of lead and instruct us, and then I'll, have, I'll pray as the worship team comes back up and, and we continue to sing. Um, and so actually, let's do this. I'm making this up as I go. Um, let's stand just in, in reverence and awe of our God. <clears throat> so Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 11, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Will you take, this is okay to take your masks down, and let's take and remember his broken body. It says, in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And then possibly our charge and one of the most exciting parts here. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Will you pray with me? Jesus, we proclaim we are a part of your story. That you have a big plan for us and there is pain and there is hurt because this world is not our home. And so, Lord, would we seize every moment to proclaim your death, and would we anxiously await your return, where we are made perfectly beautiful. God, I praise you that you use our brokenness. You redeem us back. You have bought us back. Lord, we were enemies, and now we get to run to you as sons and daughters. You are our redeemer. You have made us beautiful. And so in that power and in that position, Lord, would we now stand and sing and declare your goodness and your glory. It is in the mighty name of Jesus we pray.
Amen, amen. So grateful to be able to gather in person with you as well as online. And as we wrap up this series in the book of Ruth and just the thought of how God is in the business of taking things that are broken and making them beautiful. And even that's application to what we're going through right now. Um, it's so timely and it's so kind of him to, to walk us through that. So thank you again, Nate. Uh, thank you to each of you who shared stories of redemption. That's been such a highlight to be able to see God's faithfulness in our lives through uh, some of the most challenging, most difficult things. And, and he's unchanging. He's going to continue in that faithfulness to carry us through. So let's continue to extend grace to one another, the grace that he extends to us. Um, continue to, to fellowship. Uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, we are going to ask if you do want to hang out and catch up with people. Uh, we want you to do that, but we're going to ask you to do it outside just so that we can clean up this room and get ready for um, the upcoming services. And uh, praise God that we get to be here together, and we're going to continue to trust him. We know that he's in control, that he's good, and that he loves us. So thanks so much for being with us. God bless. We'll see you next week, uh, Saturday again, 4 p.m., and uh, Sunday, 9 and 11. Thanks again. God bless.